Hi folks, Johnny5 is almost alive. We actually have him moving, which is great. And the mechanical build of him is almost done. But we've got these six neck block parts that we 3D printed and 3D printing just isn't going to cut it. So we need to machine them. Some good stuff in this video around fourth axis work and some other really good cam workflow tips and tricks in Fusion 360. Let's dive in. So we're starting off with round bar. In this case, because it's so easy to hold onto it with a three jaw chuck on the micro arc, but there's two other sort of hidden benefits to round bar for manufacturing parts. Number one, it tends to be less expensive. The world just makes more of it. And the grain tends to run with the part, which means it may be less likely to warp on you, especially if you're machining more from one side than the other. So we were just starting off by facing the part, except we're not using a facing operation. We're actually using good old 2D contour. And it's a great fusion tip for this when you want to have really good control over what area gets faced off. And what I've done back in the manufacturing environment is I created a rectangle called area to face and 2D contour, got my quarter inch tool. If we just hold down the alt key so it just picks that edge, if we click OK, we get what you would expect, one pass along that as a 2D contour. The trick is to add roughing passes. Let's add a step over of 0.05, and we'll add 100 of them. You now have 100 roughing passes, which obviously isn't what we want. But if you check stock contours, I think it would work as is. I like to pick the box I created and click OK. It trims those toolpaths to just the area we want to machine. In this case, we want it to machine a little bit past the top of our part so that we have uh, room to slot it off and we don't have another, I think it's the eighth inch tools, collet nut rub on the remaining round bar material. Time out. When I started facing this part, I realized my tool holder is gonna collide with the chuck jaws. So a couple different options here. One is you could do longer material, but that's more wasted material and more stick out of the part. Similarly, we could get a longer tool or a longer tool holder, but not really ideal, but I realized I don't really use this three jaw chuck that often, especially the outside jaws. I'm pretty sure we've got another laying around. They're also cheap. Let's mill off the larger diameter chuck jaws. And I think this is a real testament to the 1100MX. I threw a Lakeshore carbide 3 8 inch end mill in there and just started jogging in path pilot and it machined off great. I've organized the cam in side one, which does most of the stuff on this face. Side two, where the micro arc rotates at 180 and does mostly work on this side and then the chamfer and part off, which we'll come back to. Fairly straightforward machining for the most part. It's not a particularly complicated part. We clean up the back edge, clean up the one side. I do cheat here and we rotate 180 degrees to clean up the other side. In hindsight, it may have made more sense to deck the other side of this off first before we cut this other side at A180, but it went fine that way. We're boring out this larger counter bore and in the center area. And I'm boring half from this side and in the side two, I bore half from the other side. You don't have to do that, but in this case, the focus was not cycle time. The focus was simplicity of manufacturing. We've got to make six or eight of these parts. Some of them are pairs, some of them are different. So I wanted a really simple cam operation, as few tools as possible, so we can move this over to the few different variants of the part. Drill some holes, do some more boring of these smaller counter bores. We will end up tapping some of these offline. And then uh, this is a little bit trickier. It's a relatively small key slot. We added these fillets to make them machinable. We certainly don't care to broach this part. And I'm going relatively easy with a 1 8 inch end mill, 250 surface feet per minute, 1 thou feed per tooth with only a 20 thou optimal load. I also used the stock trick to control exactly what I wanted Fusion to handle. I don't like 2D rest machining. I just find it's totally different than a lot of the model aware 3D rest machining. So I really don't ever use this, but rather use that sketch to control that area. After that, we come in and clean that up with a 2D contour in the same 1 8 inch tool and finally some chamfering. Side two is basically the same, except once we finish boring through this, we come through with a final 2D contour to give a single pass cleanup of this inside half inch bore. 
Slimming saws can be scary, especially if you haven't used them a lot. The one that we're using here happens to be a carbide tool, which is great because it allows us to run it at a higher surface speed. In this case, 900 surface feet, certainly not high relative to vertical machining centers running high performance tooling, but nevertheless, is only 1700 RPMs, which is good because anything lower and we start to lose torque on the machine's motor. But this tool has 32 teeth. So even at a 7 tenths chip load feed per tooth, it's 43 inches a minute, which is relatively fast. If you're nervous about running one of these saws, make sure to do adequate roughing passes with a relatively small radial step over. Here we're doing 60 thou per pass. And even though it's a 2D contour operation, you do need to extend the length of the tool path to make sure it doesn't lead in or out and crash into your blade. There's two different ways to do that. I'm doing it with a tangential extension distance of one inch. So it basically extends this blue line one inch both directions. You can also do it with a lead in distance. The difference between those two is what feed rate it occurs at. By doing it at the tangential extension distance, we can watch on our info screen that our feed rate is a rapid right now and then we jump to this point, we'll start and we'll move to the cutting feed rate, which is what I want because some of that blue may be where the tool is actually engaged with the material. And then the chamfer and part off. We're going to machine about 50 thou down on each side, and that allows us to come back through with a chamfer tool, get a nice edge break, machine to chamfer on all faces of the parts, and we slot down about halfway down the part from one side and then halfway down the part from the other side. There's a relatively new update in Fusion that allows you to toggle the visibility of a toolpath and leave it on. This is great because I'll leave the visibility on for the first pass, which here's the top, but we'll rotate over, it becomes the bottom. And I'll turn on the visibility for the top toolpath here, this guy right here, and I can edit this. And as an example, we'll take it down 50 thou from the model top, and you can see it's only cutting that deep, but now, if I change the bottom height to be model top, say minus 0.25, you can see that dark blue line jumps down to there, or three, that's too far. It allows you to really walk in visibly to see the gap between the blue line and the bottommost cut from the prior operation to get as close as we want to get when we part that off. Even though we're not focused on cycle time, no one wants to watch a machine plunge really slowly. And because we're never really plunging into material here, I've increased the plunge feed rate on most of the operations to something relatively high, like 200 inches a minute. And finally, our, our last stop is to interpolate and thread mill out for the half 13 thread. What's interesting is that one of these parts is right hand and the other is left hand thread, sort of acts like a turnbuckle style. But there's actually one more thing to do on this particular set of parts, which is a set screw to hold that key in place. And I don't really want to deal with having to machine this. So the idea is we're going to 3D print an alignment jig. And if we snap that onto the part, we can place this in the chuck of a drill press while it's being held in that way, clamp onto the body of our part, then remove this clamp, put a drill in our chuck, drill it and tap it. Plenty accurate enough for the task at hand. With that though, folks, it's been well over a three year journey for Johnny Five, over 3000 parts that have been made by us and from folks all over the world, mostly machined, some 3D printed. Um, but like I said, he's almost done. We'll do a dedicated video on him. Uh, and then next up is gonna be adding more of the electromechanical side of him. We wanted to have enough functionality to at least track drive him with a uh, attached sort of joystick on him. But I had this idea of, can we do it with a remote controlled system or even a telemetry suit? So more to come. As always folks, hope you learned something. Hope you enjoyed. Take care. See you soon.